Welcome to Virtual Reality's Impact on Education, Enterprise, and Medicine. Please welcome your panelists, Rick Shorten, Bob Berry, and Daniel Gregoire, and moderator, Shauna Heller. Well, thanks everyone for stopping by and uh, checking out our panel today. We're going to be talking about VR's impact on education, enterprise, and medicine. My name is Shauna Heller, and I'm the founder of Clay Park VR. Clay Park VR is a VR strategy and advisory service for corporations, brands, organizations, and developers trying to make a really meaningful landing in VR, but don't quite know how to get there. So I go in and provide a little bit of guidance and feedback, and um, I... I come to that job pretty squarely. Uh, before founding Clay Park VR, I was actually the developer relations specialist at Oculus, and I handled non-gaming, non-entertainment uh, VR app developers, working across um, enterprise, education, health, but also aerospace and architecture and sports and publishing and media and kind of all of these areas that are now kind of forming into actual, actual verticals for VR. For the year and a half that I spent at Oculus from uh, 2014 to 2015, um, I was busy trying to categorize it and then also support the developers the best I could. So I organized today's panel because I've spent a lot of time touching the verticals that are listed here. And then it was an exciting opportunity to talk to some of the developers working in that area as well. So I'll let them introduce themselves. First up would be Bob Berry. Hi there, uh, Bob Berry, CEO of Envelop VR. Uh, we are a um, application platform for immersive computing. Uh, that means uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and we're purely a software platform, hardware agnostic. And uh, we've spent uh, probably the last eight solid months uh, investigating uh, VR usage in the enterprise. Um, I'm Daniel Gregoire. These chairs are way too comfortable. Uh, I'm actually the uh, co-founder and director at Matter VR. We're focused on narrative episodic uh, virtual reality content, so story and character-driven content that answer three primary questions. The first is who or what are you in the experience? Why are you there? And does the world know you exist and does it care? I also am the owner and uh, director at uh, Halen Entertainment, a pre-visualization and visual effects company in Los Angeles as well. And my name is Rick Shorten. I'm the um, uh, CCO and co-founder of BioFlight VR. We're a um, medical enterprise um, uh, platform uh, for rapid onboarding uh, of VR for our clients. Um, we're starting with three verticals, which we'll get into in our discussion. Uh, but that is the focus of our development is enterprise level um, uh, medical focused uh, VR for training simulation and for diagnostics. Great, okay, thanks everybody. Um, so some of you have possibly been uh, at another conference where I've spoken, but um, I've kind of developed kind of a, a conversation around uh, the three S's of VR, which are uh, VR's ability to solve problems, share knowledge, and save lives. Makes it really easy to remember and thinking about how um, in enterprise there are a lot of businesses with a lot of problems and that VR is uh, becoming a solution for them. And then sharing knowledge, that's all about education and how do we um, do this original transfer of knowledge through VR as a medium, but also as a tool for education. And then saving lives. How are we going to deploy the technology and the platforms and the content in the context in, in a way that is going to um, impact the medical community from a standpoint of how are we going to reduce, uh, you know, efficiencies within a hospital, but also reduce the incidence of death and other unfortunate things that happen. Okay, so we're gonna really start off with um, a couple of questions here. And Bob, why don't we start with you? Uh, what is your professional background? Um, I've spent the better part of 25 years making video games. Um, but uh, I did have a brief uh, stint in 1998 when I moved to Japan to do my PhD in virtual reality. Um, but as everybody knows, uh, VR was pretty terrible in the 90s. Uh, all we could do is make people sick at different speeds. So we, uh, so disillusioned, I kind of went back to the, uh, the video game world. And you know, I've been running a number of video game companies. And I still have one called Uber Entertainment. Um, and a platform company in Seattle called Playfab that I founded or co-founded. And um, 
but yeah, it was about uh, t- mid 2014 when my business partner and I had taken a step back from the video game world thinking, what are we gonna do next? And my buddies over at Valve said, you know, you really should come over and check out this VR stuff we're working on. And I'm like, really? It's gonna be a thing. Uh, I knew it was gonna be a thing, but is it, is it now? Um, that was so 90s. Um, and I went over there and went into the, the tag room with markers all over the wall, the hand-built janky headsets that were super fragile. Um, and 20 minutes later, I came out and said, we're starting a VR software company tomorrow. Like, it's, it's that tech that's been 10 years away for 40 years is finally here. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Dan? So, um, I actually started in games as well in uh, 96, making pre-rendered adventure games. Um, ironically, uh, I spent three years making cube maps for 360 spherical adventure games. So, I'm sort of right back where I started. And, uh, and then ended up going and um, uh, discovering this thing called pre-visualization, which uh, is a feature film technique. Um, where we get to work with directors and producers to figure out what their vision is going to be, typically before they walk on set, sometimes as they're on set, and even now today, sometimes after they've left the set. Um, but that gives me the, the background of, of working on the box and, and building worlds. Uh, as an example, uh, I was on World War Z, uh, the Philadelphia chase scene where Brad Pitt has to escape the zombies in the, in the motorhome was actually a single set uh, digitally in Maya that we choreographed, and because the director wanted it to feel like war footage or like found documentary footage or a kid on the street with a cell phone camera, we'd actually go and stand in that world and discover what the scene would be uh, through the course of, of playing it, letting, letting it play out as it, as it would logically. And so that, that gives me, um, in terms of transitioning to VR now, the ability to look at something from a world perspective and then understand how things fit within it rather than thinking of it in, in a shot-by-shot basis. Uh, from an educational standpoint, which I completely forgot in my introduction, uh, we're also working on educational content. I worked on Cosmos, the Neil deGrasse Tyson show, uh, a couple of years ago as the animatics director, visualizing over 370 scientific and, and uh, visual effects visualizations. And uh, personally, it was the most gratifying thing I've ever done to watch YouTube videos of, of kids yelling at the screen saying, Dad, it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, and that's Jupiter. It's like I had blown things up for 15 years, and now suddenly I was having a positive impact on the world. And so I think uh, VR education uh, and, edu- and, and, and entertainment that really speaks to you emotionally is, is the best thing. Great. Thanks. Rick? Uh, my background is primarily entertainment. Um, <clears throat> prior to, to founding BioFlight VR a year ago, um, working in, uh, in visual effects and animation design, uh, eight seasons on CSI, crime scene investigation, as the visual effects supervisor or visual director. So that's, that's where I got my uh, exposure to uh, scientific and um, criminal forensic recreation. So pioneering all of the, the look of the show, the CSI look, I guess. Uh, so my team and I spend a long time doing that, a lot of time in the morgue, a lot of time, a lot of time with this, with the Cytex and the guys, uh, the, you know, the real scientists and the real CSIs learning the science of the physiology of what a, you know, a bullet does to a liver when it shoots through it. So that was my crash course in biology. And uh, a year ago, when, or a year and a half ago, when we were um, at CES and uh, Oculus was a tiny little booth in the back and not taking up the entire show floor, like this year, they had a DK1, and I had a chance to experience it. And that sort of launched the idea of what are, what are we going to do in VR? So the beginnings, the genesis of that was putting some of our CSI stuff into VR and flying around body parts that we had rendered for the show and uh, trying to work some of those simulations in a VR environment just to see what they were like. Um, so we thought we were onto something, hence the name BioFlight, a, a flight simulator for doctors was what our thoughts were around that. Since then, we've obviously uh, grown the, the concept into something much much more and much bigger. Uh, but every doctor we showed loved it, and they were wowed by the technology and wowed by the ability to see things at scale that they've never been able to see before. So that was the beginning of the company, and we've been honing our platform and our verticals ever since. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll launch into a couple of questions here um, just about you know being able to provide people with some perspective on what it's like to be in your vertical. Um, how have you been connected to the professionals in the industry you touch? And then are you being sought out or are you actively cultivating the, the vertical or is it maybe a mix of both? For, for anyone, it's, it's an open, open question. We, we've definitely been um, approached by a number of different um, 
like verticals or, or you know enterprise clients within certain verticals um, if they've been if they've been tinkering with VR internally typically you have like a little innovation lab inside of an enterprise where they're trying to figure out what to do with this new t newfangled technology and they suddenly hear like oh there's an enterprise VR company out there they're all over you because uh, there's just not that many people out there you know you know saying that hey we're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna work with enterprises um, so you know we've been a you know, and it's like snowballs like once one of them comes out and talks to you, you start working with them and then maybe a little bit word gets out that you know such and such is working with this particular auto manufacturer the next thing you've got ten of them knocking on your door and it's just like wow um, so yeah they've we've definitely not had a problem of, of interest it's more of a problem of you know it, making sure like do you find that that yeah, like you'll it, have people it, coming to you and saying oh we want to get in like we want to do VR and and yeah. They don't know how, and so they're trying to. And, and sometimes they don't shove even. They, they they don't realize what they want is not actually what they want, right. and they they don't know what they want, or they have very unrealistic expectations about what they can do or what they should do, and so there's there's a, a education process that has has to happen, mm -hmm. and this this is one of the things that makes the um, you know the enterprise a very tough nut to crack is because it's naturally a long, slow sales cycle into an enterprise. But when you add- Incredibly a, long. And when you add a newfangled technology that nobody understands on top of it, um, and you can't explain it with your hands and, and voice, you have to actually put it on somebody's face. And then they're like, oh, and then they start to get it. Well, how do you sell that upwards into the enterprise? You know, It's just demo after demo after demo, and it's, yeah, it's, it's long and slow. <laughs> How about you, Dan? You've been universities mm -hmm. and educators, educators reaching out to you? So we have a diverse slate, let's say. And we've started, our, our initial thought was, you know, we come from narrative storytelling and film and TV and, and video games. Let's focus on that. Um, however, with our Cosmos background, my partner Steve Holtzman um, and I actually met on Cosmos having that experience being connected to universities in our research efforts for that show, et cetera, we've suddenly found that uh, education is actually something that people are really seriously interested and uh, interested in investing in as well. And so just within the last few months have we really started to think about developing a vertical in that space where we're taking uh, the knowledge and storytelling ability that we have uh, developed over the last 20 years and applying that to education so that you have a really premium educational um, experience where kids can go in and, and, and really explore things rather than simply having them presented. Like the Wright them. Brothers experience? Yeah, like the Wright Brothers. The first piece uh, that we did as a company was the Wright Brothers First Flight called FIRST, um, where we had to work with the Smithsonian to sort of deductively reason out what really happened that day. There's diaries, there's pictures, there's all these sorts of things, but there's all these little missing pieces. Like every stone you, you figure out, every, st every stone you look under, there's a new problem to figure out. And, and through that process, we've, we've developed this experience um, that allows you to you know, walk up to people and, and it tells you who they were, what they were doing there that day. Like for instance, nobody probably knows that there was just a 16-year-old kid just walking down the beach from his house that morning, just happened to stumble upon seeing the first uh, human-powered flight. So. There's all these sorts of things, and by being there and seeing it, just like reading a script, everybody sees a different picture in their head. But now being there and experiencing it firsthand, suddenly it's all laid bare and it's very clear, and it's actually very exciting as well. Okay. Rick, how about for you? How are people reaching out to you or vice versa? We, um, so, you know, um, like Bob said, selling into enterprise is a slow process. Well, imagine trying to do it in medical. Um, medical is 15 years behind the rest of us. They're using Windows 95, 15-year-old computers and radiology labs. Um, you know, it, you, you, go, you walk into these places and, um, yeah, it's, you know, you, you, it, there's all these commercials that show, like, high-tech and doctors walking through virtual hallways, and I have, n I have yet to seen it in a single institution. Um, it's happening more in education and, at, and in the, the um, you know, the medical schools and the training hospitals. They're embracing it much quicker than clinical application. Um, that doesn't scare us, but it just as an illustration of anybody in this room thinking about doing enterprise, and especially in a, in a highly regulated area like, like medicine where policy and protocol and compliances are, you know, it's Herculean to, to navigate. But um, it's a gigantic uh, 
market with no ceiling. And there are so and a many ton of problems. and a ton I of mean, problems. And everybody that we meet from neurologists through heart doctors all want to use this technology. And what I tell people that who we're building for, they say, well, who are you building this for? Because, you know, it's going to be 10 years before a radiologist can actually use this in clinical practice. And I say, well, you know, the, the, the doctors that are three years away from finishing their fellowship, those are our, those are our clients because they're used to this type of immersive training. They want this type of training. They don't want training from the 70s and the 80s. They want training for the next generation. And so virtualizing that content and giving them new, new technologies uh, as part of the BioFlight platform, by the time they're ready to, to be in practice, BioFlight will be there with them in clinical practice. So, so we look at that exposure. And so it, to, to answer your question, we have reached out to uh, training hospitals. So whether it's Keck or UCLA or Duke or any of the major training hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Case Western University, who's doing a HoloLens, a whole HoloLens program. We're trying to find people who are active in technologies that, that mirror our platform design and we reach out and offer to partner with them, whether it's on content development or integration of, of platform and their, their protocol and their content on our platform. And the response has been? It's, it's been uh, fantastic because they, you know, in, in medical imaging and in medical content, it, it's also a bit of, um, you know, a function before form. And there's sort of this inflection point where the stuff that Dan and I and Bob have done for 20 years in creating high-end <laughs> visuals for f TV and film can now find its way into practical applications in medical training. And people kind of expect it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the new generation doesn't want the, the blocky old training simulations or the, you know, the, the Windows 95. They have expectations that are much more advanced. So that's part of our focus is to make sure that that is a premium experience for them. And it's not like, well, you know, it's VR is beginning. So that's, that's, that's kind of how good it, it's going to be. I don't think that's an argument you can have today mm -hmm. or, t or tomorrow. It needs S to be better. So what is the reaction like across, like for all of you, uh, when you're sharing like the headsets and the software and the experiences and things like that, or the, you know, the, the tool itself, what is the reaction within enterprise, within, with the educators in the medical community? Like, is it the headset comes off and it's gee whiz, or is it like, we don't know, or like, we think it's just for a game. Like, what has it been for you? Uh, we've, uh, I I don't, I can't think of a single time somebody's taken off an Oculus or a Vive and not been a con converted and, and become a believer. They're like, I get it now. Or they're like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. I just couldn't believe it. Um, it you know, just experiencing is believing. You, you have to put, and, and, it, and it's about the experience you put them in, right? Like, I always say, like, the hardware is good enough now not to make you sick but the content can make you sick instantly. You have to be very careful about you know, what you put on yourself and also what you put on other people's face. Um, yeah, there's a, a way of confusing that it's the headset that makes you sick as opposed to the content that makes you sick. And, and nothing is worse than, you know, I, I go back to my time at Oculus when I would hear people just be like, oh, I tried it, but I got really sick. I'm like, it was the content. Yeah, like, don't you don't know, play you, Temple Run inside yeah. of VR. Yeah, you want really <laughs> get off re the roller coaster. <laughs> really easy, smooth content, high frame rate, all that good stuff. Yeah, for, fortunately, our stuff, you know, you know, our software is basically like a VR shell for Windows. It allows you to use your PC while you're in Windows or while you're in VR. So it's a very comfortable experience. We're not like you know, ha there's not stuff whizzing by your face, and we're not trying to, m you know, move move you in a virtual space. It's just, you know, your head is the camera, and we never take control away from that. And so it's just ours, is, we have the benefit of just having a very natural, comfortable experience. So when we go off a demo, we never have, we've never had a single person, like, feel off or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, ours has been, it's been actually quite a journey. We've been showing it now for a little over a year um, to, all sorts of people, and, and, and just like Bob said, like everybody comes away with this wow uh, response, but what I find the most fascinating is the journey, the mental journey people go through once they've done it. They just sort of stare into space for a while, and they're like, you know, wow, <laughs> you know, like their, their minds have been blown, and, and uh, we've had a couple of responses where I've ha I, we had a lady start to cry in the headset because what she saw was so personal and dear to her that it re elicited this emotional response and she just wanted to show it to everybody. So, you know, she started bringing people by. And then I had another, I had a, a Japanese director. The, at one point in the demo, the plane actually flies right over your head. And, and if you're familiar with the first flight, it, the plane doesn't get very high. It's only going five miles an hour over the ground because um, it's fighting a, a headwind. And it only flies 120 feet. So it's a rather 
unremarkable <laughs> flight, but still remarkable for history. And, and this, this, this Japanese director literally like fell over backwards watching it and I, I caught him, you know? And, and he was like, it was like a trust fall, you know? <laughs> and he was like totally still into the way. He didn't wanna, he didn't wanna disengage, you know? And, um, and, and we've been to companies and, and uh, educational places and, and, and all just you see the light go off. It's like, I've been trying to teach this for 40 years and now I can just I can I pu can put people in it, and they can and can they can see it for themselves and understand what it is, and and and, and hopefully it means something to them personally when they're done. How about you, Rick? How's the how's the response been? The uh, it's it's been overwhelming, and um, you know one of the verticals we're working on is a diagnostic vertical, so using patient-specific uh, MR and CT data and virtualizing it, <clears throat> giving the doctors a chance to use volume volume rendering data and segmentation uh, to get in there and really explore. And so every time we roadshow, I get sent, I get in my, in, in my FedEx, I get uh, DVDs, DICOM DVDs from neurosurgeons to, to orthopedic surgeons of scans of patients that they want to have virtualized so they can look for things. Uh, we were just in Louisiana with our doctor group and one of the orthopedic surgeons had a patient who had you know, a, sh a shattered shoulder, uh, you know, 12 different fractures and the 3D scan that's available to them on a Terra Recon was, had huge gaps in it. There was, he just, you know, there's huge chunks missing. Did he show you? He showed it to me, yeah. He showed me the, the th he asked for the 3D version and that came upstairs and it's still, you know, on a flat little screen the size of a postcard and he's supposed to diagnose with that. And he said, I'm gonna send you this data if you guys could please virtualize it and send it back so I could see, you know, get in behind it and see where all the fragments and pieces are. So, you know, so every time we have this, our demos, we get the exact same response. If it's a neurosurgeon looking for a pituitary uh, tumor or something that's gonna be difficult to operate on, they wanna see the data, so we take their data and we process it and we send it back to them. And we're not even a live platform. We're doing this, at, you know, for education purposes, but they're making requests mm -hmm. when they see it because they see the value in it. And so immediately the response is, I need to use this because I have patients today and diagnoses to do that could benefit from me having access to this to this visualization. And, and this touches on a, a an important point, and and one that I'll, be, I'll make in my uh, mini keynote tomorrow is that the looking at three D data on a flat surface is uh, you're lo you lose so much information. Um, you lose the the tiny little eye movement that you're that. Uh, picks up extra information and helps create that 3D model in your brain. Um, you lose your head motion. It, it's, it's just non-intuitive. It's not the way you're meant to be processing that kind of information. And even if you can drag it with your mouse and rotate the thing, your brain is still doing mental gymnastics to try to reason about that information. So I like to say, you know, VR is it's formatted for your brain. I mean, it's presenting the information the way your brain is meant to um, actually experience it. And because of that, you will um, gain additional insights. You're gonna learn faster, you're gonna retain more information. Um, and it reminds me of that doctor in Miami who you know, uh, threw up the, the picture of a heart of some child that he was trying to do surgery on, put it in a cardboard, and he's Google like- Google saves baby. Yeah, Google saves baby. That was a, a great headline from, from January, I think it was. And, uh, and But that's that just reinforces that idea that um, experiencing it in an immersive environment is is the natural way you should be seeing that data. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dan, you didn't set out to make first an educational piece specifically, but uh, the quality level has really kind of made you guys the target of a lot of inquiry recently. When you think about the um, uh, way that it can present certain topics or subjects in school, what do you think are the strongest? And then do you think that those, those subjects in school are the most uh, underserved right now? I think educational uh, organizations from you know, K through 12 and, and college are all suffering from uh, budget cuts and, and limits to uh, resources or um, you know, lawsuits or injured kids have you know shut down chemistry labs. There's all, all sorts of things that that educational uh, people or you know educational institutions are, are are struggling against. And what's what's cool is you know in VR you can blow up the lab. You know nobody gets hurt. <laughs> so so why not give them all the chemicals that you would never want them playing with otherwise, or um, or you know physics demonstrations. 
you know, there's all sorts of physics demonstrations that might imperil a student body, literally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now you can do those things. Or impale. Or, or impale, yeah, exactly. Like my, my, uh, my, uh, my teacher in, in high school launched a rocket into the ceiling accidentally. Um, you know, you could do that now without, you know, filling the room with smoke and having everybody evacuate the school. So um, I think there's, there's really no, no, no conceptual limit. Um, but you kind of touched uh, on STEM. Sure, there's, there's like all these, you... these core competency things that kids don't always have access to. Mm -hmm. and, now, and now, I mean, frankly, uh, you could get them in the schools, but you could also get them at home. I mean, um, I liken this to pre-visualization, the thing I did first, which is the democratization of hardware and software to kids in their bedroom to allow us to do high-end 3D graphics for a very small price. And now you've got this ability to build these things and put them in bedrooms of kids around the world. And so people coming out of, uh, out of high school even, or even grade school might be that much further ahead in the thing that they're, s they're ultimately very passionate about. So. so what do you think successful VR education may look like? It's okay to speculate a little. Boy. Well, I mean, you could probably shut down schools if you didn't want to socialize your kids, but <laughs> well, well, I can't that, imagine what would happen on, on the that, internet. That yeah. VR is antisocial, which you no, know, which it could, we could totally argue be. About. Yeah, although because there's no physical reality to it, I, I, I don't know if it would be descend into the, the Lord of the Flies scenario, on, and as as the YouTube comments are, but but uh, but you certainly could you certainly could have continuing education. Uh, you know, if you loved it at school, you lo you can do it at home. Uh, collaborative projects across uh, the spectrum. I think one of the things that's so great about the internet is the idea that people from around the world can collaborate rather than just people in your neighborhood. And I think that could be a very powerful thing as well. As, you know, a, a kid in uh, the Middle East might have a fantastic idea for something or, or want to learn something about um, chemistry or physics or math that he or he or she just doesn't have access to. And I think it has a potentially very, very opening effect. Yeah, just imagine going on a virtual field trip with other kids from around the world and what better way to experience or learn about like the Egyptian pyramids but to actually really feel like you're there and, and actually see them at the, the, the correct scale. Oh, yeah. um, it's just awe-inspiring. And, and I, can, I can imagine a classroom being filled with you know, experience after experience after experience. And I think I do believe that this type of technology is going to help kids learn faster and retain information better. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, when you see something, most people are actually visual learners, but we've been stuck in this reading learning or lecturing learning uh, circuit for the last thousand years. And now you can actually do, see, touch, feel, well, you can't smell yet, but in fact, hopefully actually, that never happens. But Back more. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, we're, but, but you know, when you do something, you learn it. Yep. Absolutely. So, Envelop, immersive computing platform. Uh, you've had it in beta now, you said about 2,000 users, private beta, and um, can you talk a little bit about the feedback you get from your clients, from your enterprise, uh, from the enterprise side that helps you shape and mold what that final product is gonna look like? Yeah, I mean. Uh, and I guess I'll be fair. What I'm trying to get is, like, what is the communication flow between your clients on the corporate side and and your client and and your platform itself? It's very different, or is it very similar to the gaming back and forth? Um, no, it's it's well bec because we've been in private beta. It's definitely not similar to the gaming thing. Like we we just launched our public beta today, so we're expecting to be you know inundated with you know you know, a this application isn't working right or this thing's not working right, we're gonna get a ton of that stuff because we're trying to be a generic platform that allows you to use all of your existing Windows applications in VR um, and then provide a pathway through our SDK to extend them incrementally into VR. And the whole, the reason behind that is like, you know, I wanna be able to use Excel in VR, right? Because I wanna have a giant spreadsheet. And, but I don't wanna have to rewrite Excel to be a real-time 3D application. Um, that doesn't just doesn't make any sense. It's useful in its natural form. But Excel, at a certain point, would like to do a little bit of VR, like push a graph into your immersive environment, like as a data landscape, so I can walk around the data, and I can stick my face in the data. Infinite spreadsheets. Yes, yes. That's oh, getting exciting. So, so we have, you know, when we have people contact us, it's, it's very, for lots of different use cases. They're thinking about, here's how I would use, you know, an infinite desktop kind of, kind of thing. Like, we have uh, stock 
uh, day traders, you know, the stockbroker guys that have nine physical monitors on yeah. their desk and they wish they had more. Yeah. And so they have to use that as a destination to go do their work. Well, what if you could just take those nine monitors wherever you, wherever you went with, with a little headset, mm -hmm. you know, maybe remote into the cloud, into those resources, have a little Bluetooth mouse and keyboard and, hey, I'm day trading on the plane. Yeah, you know? mission control. Exactly. Mission control just for you. Um, so, you know, so we're not really a specific product for a specific use case in a specific vertical. We're, it's an application platform that, you know, we're only just starting to scratch the surface of what people are imagining that they could do with it. And that's, that's really exciting. But when we go into an enterprise, um, you know, our killer value prop is, you know, whenever an enterprise is trying to adopt some newfangled technology, more often than not, the solutions that come to them or people that are coming to sell solutions are selling you this bespoke vertical system that they have to figure out, how do I integrate this into my workflow? Mm -hmm. So how do I get data into this system? How do I get data out of it? What if I want to modify it? How does it get, that get, you know, fed back into the workflow? And that's, it's expensive, it's cumbersome, it's hard to wrap your head around. But we go in and we say, no, we'll take your existing process and your existing workflow, we'll pull it into VR, and then we'll extend it only where VR really makes sense, right? Like, just at this precise point in your workflow, you want to be in VR for 90 seconds to verify you know, the scale of a particular object you're about to manufacture 300 of. Yeah. And if we can help them, you know, in just that, that 90 seconds prevent an error, that mm -hmm. can save them millions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So that's... Yeah. I spend a lot of time trying to help them uh, with intention, right? Because uh, until you get uh, more of the enterprise uh, exposed to the hardware and the different applications and things like that, they're, they, the, really the thinking is kind of like, oh, this might be a, a blanket solution or, oh, this wouldn't solve anything. It's, it's, so, it's all about getting them exposed to it. Rick, there have been some people, uh, developers and universities exploring virtual reality for a while now in a way to treat phobias, PSD, PTSD, I'm sorry. So your approach is a little different and you were mentioning it earlier that it's kind of a larger uh, initiative that you're putting forth with some short-term goals and long-term goals. Why that instead of just 360 video of surgery? Why, you know, what's moving you? What's your mandate? Um, you know, I think we we started out doing um, we started out with uh, uh, you know a feature which was diagnostics, and for a while we thought that was our product. We we're going to do a diagnostic product, and we're going to create that. But when we spoke to people, you know, there's a whole bunch of there's a whole um, you know you need to envelop it, uh, and there you need to create a place for it to be um, you know to live. Uh, you need a toolbox. Um, you know, this is not something that our clients can go into Best Buy and pull off the shelf. You know, they need an enterprise ready, no hassle, bulletproof place for this content to live. And they need to be able to interact, you know, they need to modify it specific to their to their vertical and to their needs. And so it, it sort of occurred to us over time that we don't need a we we don't need a feature as a product, we need a platform as a product with features that are specific to our clients' needs and give them a chance to either start with where we've begun, so stand on our shoulders and customize or work with us to customize something for them. But the idea of a white label platform is what everyone keeps asking me for. They're like, where do we start? And if they were to sit down <clears throat> where we are today, they're already a year behind, but then they've got another year uh, of testing and, and development. So we just figured, let's get to a place where everybody in medical, all the boxes will be checked. The code will be HIPAA compliant right from the beginning, whether we use that in clinic, clinical you know, uh, use case right away or not, it'll be built that way from the first line of code. So everything that we know are all the pain points for our medical clients, um, we're, we're trying to address those so they don't have to go put together a giant three-year you know, stakeholder study to figure out how to even begin writing the first line of code. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And then this is kind of for everybody. In your opinions, where do you see professionals and organizations getting the most out of VR right now as opposed to two years from now? Like where can, where can an organization really, you know, get some use out of VR? I'll jump in here. Okay. Because this is what we've been telling them is um, there's, a, there's a huge knowledge gap on the patient side. Um, so if you're talking about doctors uh, explaining to their patients why they've diagnosed them a certain way, wouldn't it be great if you could put them in a gear and uh, show them their diagnosis and walk them through it? 
So, you know, part of our, our discussion with them is how do we educate, you know, the whole user group inside of that medical space? And an easy way to do that is just uh, patient education, getting it in front of your clients or working with your internal teams on training and education to try to either bring people together in collaborative study or to explain something that's more complex mm -hmm. um, or to close that gap. So I think a great place to start is education. I think that's a, um, it's content that can be created today, it's content that can be distributed today, it's content that people can access, can access today, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a baby step because it doesn't have to be you know, completely immersive, and, uh, not immersive, but completely interactive. It can be very you know, just illustrative and educational. And I think that's a good place to start. It lets them sort of baby step into, into it without trying to reimagine their entire sales training system or their entire you know, uh, 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 con uh, uh, tr you know, training, training systems. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to break everything apart to begin. Mm -hmm. So I think working around the edges seems to be, it, people are responding very well to those suggestions. Mm -hmm. So set, set a bit of a high bar with a low exception. Sounds about right. Yeah. How about you, Dan? What does educational like success look like right now? Well, I mean, there's already a ton of great content out there, whether it be still or 360 video or, or whatnot of 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 you know, grand locations, you know, whether it's geography or or uh, geology or uh, things that we could just walk out our back door and, and snap a picture of. You know, figuring out what the leaves on the trees, what kind of tree is that? You know, I remember my leaf study from high school. Uh, instead of ripping them all off the trees and posting them on a board. Now you can just go out and take pictures of all the trees and, and put those together into a school project and with like a Gear VR or um, a Google Cardboard or a you know, Rico Theta or a, you know, a, a Gear three, Samsung Gear 360, you could totally just go out there and create your own projects mm -hmm. uh, to present to the class or, or even for teachers to go out and collect things that they want to uh, um, talk to their students about. In, in, in the other direction. Interesting. I think part of it, uh, I should have prefaced it a little bit, is that uh, Google has Google is doing their expeditions program to bring you know the 360 video in, and they just announced some sort of initiative. I think it was just to bring more 360 in with uh, Pearson mm -hmm. at the big uh, education conference uh, last month. So there are some initiatives, and Oculus, of course, did the VR for Good campaign, taking headsets into uh, nine Bay Area, Bay Area high schools to turn students into content creators. And I was actually really excited to be a part of that program. So there are some formal pro programs going on, but what you're saying is actually, why don't we create you know, content creators out of the students and out of the teachers? And that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, or even just field trips. I know Google's doing like networked field trips so everybody in the class can actually visit the same place at the same time, mm -hmm. some place they would never have a hope in a million years of going at that age or, or time or moment in space. Mm -hmm. so. Bob, what were mm -hmm. you thinking? Um, you know, I. For all, when we were doing our enterprise analysis, one of the to try to figure out which vertical should we be going after, one of our uh, things that we filtered heavily on or weighted heavily was are are they already working in 3D? Mm -hmm. That was really important to us. We didn't want to have to take them from 2D to 3D and then 3D to immersive. We didn't want that extra hop. We just so you know architectural visualizations, you know commercial real estate, uh, industrial design. Uh, manufacturing, mm -hmm. like, and we, in every one of those, um, you know, verticals, we found at least one entity that was already taking advantage of, of VR is somewhere in the workflow, but, but, but you take any vertical, um, there's probably a dozen use cases within that vertical, right? It's such a fundamental technology. It's like, it's like the internet itself. It's like, how, how's the internet going to affect business? Yeah. Well, it's like, well, you know, many different use cases are among uh, every single vertical. So we, th we feel it's the same way. So that's that's definitely the place where we saw it uh, most prevalent use and design. people actually getting stuff out of it. Yeah, yeah being able design to is the gateway. S being able to see a 3D object that you were designing on a flat screen in an immersive environment the, with the whole point of like, am, can I gain a new insight? Can I, can I detect an error? Can I correct something? Can I, can I fix a scale problem? Like, that's really what it what it comes down to is experiencing that object, even just for a brief time. Yep. You know, it's incredibly compelling. You get you get that word a lot in the VR world. Is it compelling? It's compelling. Yes, yes, it's compelling. Fear not. So then, um, what's the most outrageous thing people have started asking you for? What's the most like not even outrageous, but just like far out there moonshot or like wow, that's a amazing idea. Too soon. Like, are there are you guys getting pitched back? frequently on uh, different projects to try to undertake? 
we we had a um, we were working with a major auto manufacturer on a on a brand experience, and you know we were ready to to we were going to do all of the design for that, but they they their marketing team felt they know they we have to bring in a professional you know marketing firm for the brand design. They're going to design the VR experience with you know zero VR uh, experience yeah zero experience doing this, <laughs> and and the the design that they came up with the proposal was bat s crazy like it was just and it broke pretty much every single rule of vr of things that you don't do to the the user mm -hmm. in vr from you know putting them like on a high speed driving course you know with like twists and turns to um actually like while the person's in a seated experience like physically moving them from one place to another like rolling <laughs> their chair somewhere else which We're is just gonna, gonna come make up behind them and sneak up yeah. on them and like surprise was, them oh yeah good luck it was with that. unbelievable oh and they wanted it all done for like 100k or something stupid mm -hmm. right it was like no this is <laughs> it was just so far out there how about you yeah, yeah i guess I, I haven't run across anything that wasn't accomplishable although i i always tend to look at things half uh, half full um, so I'm always trying to solve. It's like, okay, well, they've suggested this. How can we actually do that without, you know, either making the person sick while still while still addressing um, things that people are asking for? But there is, we, you know, just I'm sure like everybody else here, we're always bumping up against the, you know, the hot thing now is VR, and everybody wants to do VR, and everybody thinks it costs like a dollar. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we're constantly going, yes, we're really excited about this, and then they're like, here's the money, and we're like, ooh. <laughs> There's no chance you're getting that done for that price, but, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's you know we we all have to take on an educational um, role as people doing this early to make sure that people go through the thought process. I meant the process I mentioned earlier, which is sort of the wow, what would be cool in VR? To you know, what would just simply be cool, and how do we do that in VR? Yeah. And that's like the mental transition I find a lot of people making. And some of them make it and some of them don't. We've had people go you know, through like a two hour session and put the headset on and then and they're like, okay, I got an idea. So this thing's gonna come in from the screen left. And you're like, all right, you don't get it. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> there is no screen left. Yeah, that can be a challenge. Any moonshots come your way, Rick? Uh, you know, I think they're for that us. That aren't yours? That aren't ours. Yeah, no, I mean, um, there's a lot of uh, aspirational, um, you know, emails in my inbox from the from the, the specialists that we see and show the technology to. And, and you know, and the companies also, you know, they look at this as a way to, to improve uh, the effectiveness of training and education. And the big one, I think, is the connective, you know, and I'm sure we'll get there, is why we, you know, are always looking to connect with hardware manufacturers. Uh, and people doing peripherals, whether it's you know hands-free or haptics, because they're asking us for that. They want to they want to replace cadaveric training, um, and around the globe, cadaveric training is incredibly expensive and incredibly difficult to do. Um, and but you know the, right now they're like, unless you're really cutting in on somebody, you're not going to learn. Um, you know, so when when the the haptics and the technology catch up, so it's a mixed experience where you feel like you're holding a proxy tool, like a like a scalpel, or you're really really doing the suturing. Um, so we're trying to s problem solve around that. What can we use that's that's tactile and real today? Mm -hmm. But what can we teach them in VR that's cognitive and lets them practice and learn, and then you know um, dive into actually you know trying to simulate and, uh, the muscle memory that goes into you know doctor training or simu or, or surgical training. So it's trying to bridge the gap between where we are with technology now and where the, the problems they want to solve today. But it's going to take us a few years to sort of move move it all you know, into a virtual environment, but that's what, that's what they want. They're asking for it already. Cool. Uh, we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted to make sure uh, that we talk a little bit about it for the developers out there, a little bit about uh, business models. Without going and doing deep dives, what industries and what previous, you know, how are you, how are you thinking about business models, pricing out your services, your products, your platforms, your things like that? Is there anything you can share? Nothing that I can share. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're speaking. we're we're looking at a we're we're a soft base, we're a software company and you know there's obviously hardware partnerships and things we're looking at but if I was a software developer in VR which I am um, you know there's a there's a, a, a subscription based model there's a license uh, component to our uh, platform 
um, and, and partnerships. You create a platform, you get an ecosystem, and we want to encourage uh, devs to come develop on top of the BioFlight platform. Think about a, something for rheumatology or uh, you know, a vertical I in a medical niche that's maybe underserved, but there's 5,000 you know, users out there or, pr or practitioners that desperately want it. So create it on the platform, work with us, and we'll, we'll collaborate. Um, so we're, we're, there's, I guess that covers the whole, the whole um, you know, um, uh, gamut, but that's the umbrella that we're living under right now. So there's a lot of ways for us to sort of figure out how to collaborate, monetize, whether it's content creation, licensing, or subscription service. Okay. You haven't come from uh, 15 years of service work uh, where it looks like we're going to go out of business two months ago, or two months, uh, two months from now for like 15 years. Uh, this is kind of a, for the VR side, we're, we're looking at multiple different things, like self-funding some things, raising money for some things. Uh, in Hollywood, nobody ever bets their own money, so there's, you know, in the entertainment space, it's, that's a really tough one. Um, so how do you raise money on, for, for a piece of content that doesn't really have a monetization strategy yet? Uh, there is an ROI out there now with, you know, a million gears and maybe half a million high-end headsets, but but that's not like the two billion numbers that say cell phones have. Uh, so it's a real challenge to get people to take a bet, to give you money based on uh, the road ahead, you know, building something that could pay off much, much later. And so, you know, we're, you know, we're looking at co-productions, co-financing, you know, friends and family, you know, there's all these different methodologies that you could, you could apply to, to this. And then of course, uh, we're platform agnostic when it comes to distribution. So we have a giant spreadsheet of all the authoring technologies, whether it be light fields or point clouds or game engines or 360 video or, you know, all the new cool things that are coming out. And then we have distribution on the other side. And if we can't draw a line between those two things, then we probably can't use it yet because we want to be able to monetize across any platform that's available out there. Okay. And is this the four minutes for everything or four minutes for the wrap-up? Q&A? Q&A now, okay. Um, Rick, would you mind sharing your microphone and then Dan and you can, they're gonna use that. Just, we only have one mic from the audience, so, or for the audience, so why don't we just kind of go starting at the beginning. Um, I'm really interested in the responsibilities we have in social impact VR and, and the content that, you know, there's so many delicate issues around the world. We've created a series in, about child trafficking about children that are being trafficked to and from Latin America, and we're working with specialists across the board in this area. We've even sent GoPro cameras on actual rescues for reference footage, but it begs the question, when you're telling stories about survivors and their survivors might see it, or where you're telling stories about police shootings, and there's, con you know, there's all kinds of points of view on both sides of it, or the gay rights movement, or welfare, or the environment, and, and, and on and on, domestic violence, I'd, I'd like to hear from you guys about where do you fall in that gamut of like what you show and because it's so visceral, how much it could almost negatively affect people. It, it might have the opposite reaction of what you're trying to attempt. Maybe could each of you can um, reflect actually, on? Actually, you know, I think just to kind of keep it short, this is actually more of an enterprise education and healthcare. So I'm not sure there might be more uh, appropriate uh, panels for this maybe tomorrow. Sir. Marlon Flint has, uh, <clears throat> has started up VR Causes. Uh, we're doing a lot of education with foundations. They have so many questions. Their grantees are asking them for funding uh, to create virtual reality. Have you guys made any contact with any of the big foundations around the country? Uh, what are they asking you? And you know, how have you sort of navigated that conversation to fund these things? <laughs> we haven't had a lot of in, uh, contact with them yet, although we've had adjunct, like, um, um, you know, people from Stanford, people from various universities, uh, um, Tennessee, um, from the actual faculty level, and, and I forget what, it's like faculty, but not faculty, but they're there to advise. Adjuncts. Adjuncts, something like that, yeah. Um, right now, we're actually relatively early in sort of um, setting up that vertical, so we're just exploring now where it is, but, but I think you're right. There are a lot of people asking a lot of questions about how this can apply. Rick, have you had any experience with foundations or other granting? Um, granting. Yeah, we did a. I did a 3D grant for uh, amblyopia, so the study of uh, lazy eye in children. So it wasn't. It wasn't VR. We want to do a VR version of it for the next one, but that went through the Deborah Boone 
and um, we worked with uh, Tufts University in Boston, and uh, they had a whole pilot program. They came to us uh, to help uh, create the content around the study. So they're actually in study now. They started with their first patients last month, um, but that was you know that was a successful beginning. And you know, there's I think a lot of these funds seem to be um, very progressive as far as like, you know, it's it, as opposed to government, the private foundations seem to be very very open to um, to uh, pushing forward a new technology and taking a look at it, even if it's brand new and nobody at the foundation has had experience with it. So um, uh, opposed to government money, it seems like the private foundations are a little bit more progressive. That's been our experience. Great, thanks, Rick. We have time for one more question right over here. Oh, sorry, yeah. it was. Well, mine's, mine's really quick, and it's, it's totally relevant. Can you, you were talking about social and group experiences inside VR. Are you looking to do that in your applications, or you're trying to br uh, cooperate with like Altspace and Big Screen and other companies? Yeah, I mean, we support, uh, it's on our roadmap to support networking and collaboration, um, because this is um, not only what the enterprise wants and needs, like they want to be able to collaborate over a piece of, you know, an engineering model that they're discussing so um, yeah we're building that into our platform too yeah both Rick uh, yeah the um, the whole the, if you come see our demo on the floor you know the idea is you're in a room and there could be multiple people in that room we're talking about collaborative study across the globe so medical excellence no matter where you are and bringing that together so that's absolutely a foundation of the platform absolutely great and then final question hi I was involved in uh, educational multimedia back in the mid 80s 90s and um, there was a wow factor then too that that attracted a lot of educators but it didn't get real until they'd actually written it into their budgets mm -hmm. and so i'm wondering what is it that you see schools having to buy are they going to have to equip an entire classroom with uh you know with the headsets are they going to what are they what are they going to be purchasing and when do you see this actually becoming a budget line item so do you mind if i tackle this um, so really what it takes early on is uh, proving out, right? Doing some longitudinal, s or brief longitudinal studies, doing some ABs where we have textbook learning against virtual learning and just doing polling data. So for the next two years, it's gonna be polling data to prove out that this is a, a you know, a, a com impactful way to learn and to, to gain knowledge and have knowledge transferred to you. So it's gonna become a budget, like a line item in a budget probably right around the end of year two is my guess because we're gonna already be, like we're gonna be pulling data on the medical training side by the end of this year. And so as soon as data starts coming out that we can start basing better decisions on, that's when it goes into the budgets. And thank you everybody, I've gotta click it back. There is everybody, yep. thanks thank panelists. You.